you would go ahead and take your Bibles and be turning to Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to be focusing our attention in verse 5 in just a few moments. Galatians 1 and verse 5. I want to say how grateful I am to be here with you tonight. Thankful so much for the honor and the privilege, the invitation that has been extended. So grateful for Jonathan, the good work that he is doing, the, the elders that are serving here. Appreciate them so very much. I first became acquainted with the East Hill congregation, I guess it was about 15 years ago in May of 2001. When I was a student in the Memphis School of Preaching, Corey and I were classmates together. The first time that I ever visited here was during your lectureship. And I want to tell you that I was very, very impressed with the membership here uh, from the very first time that I met you. I was impressed with your eldership, was impressed with your ministers, and, and I am still impressed with the great work that continues to be done here in Pulaski, Tennessee with the East Hill Congregation. And I remember sitting there 15 years ago dreaming of what it would be like to be a speaker on the Truth and Love Lectureship. And little did you know that that invitation that was extended to me earlier this year was a dream of mine. And so that dream is becoming a reality tonight. And I am so thankful to be a part of the great lectureship that you're having here this year. I'm so thankful for that invitation. When you think about the lectureships that you've had, and you think about all of those red books, and I don't know if you had different colors in, in years past, but I've got a whole section in my library that are the East Hill books, that are the Truth and Love Lectureship books. And I have used them and referenced them a number of times. Your lectureships are always ones that have themes that are very timely. The topics are very pertinent. They're ones that are very relevant. And this year, it's no different. This year, the topic, the theme, is one that is very much needed in our society today. It's one that's needed for the church. In fact, when we open up our songbooks, we can see the title of this song. It was a song that was written in the late 19th century in 1875 by Fanny J. Crosby, To God Be the Glory. However, long before the words of that song were written, there were some very similar words written in the first century through the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul. When you look at Galatians chapter 1, beginning there at verse 3, and going down through about verse 5, the Apostle Paul is going to be putting the focus on the God of heaven. And then he says, to whom be glory forever and ever. You know what he's saying there? To God be the glory. And what we're going to be studying about through this lectureship is that exact phrase. Tonight we're going to be looking at the topic, living our lives to the glory of God. And as we think about living our lives to the glory of God, we're going to study that topic by answering three different questions. Number one, we're going to be asking ourselves, what does it mean to glorify God? Number two, we're going to be asking ourselves, why should we glorify God? And then finally, number three, how can we glorify God? Let's begin first of all in talking about the what. Well, what does it mean to glorify God? Well, whenever I preach on a particular topic that is especially going to be centering on one word or another, I think it's very important that you define your terms. I think it's very important that you have a basic understanding from the very onset of what certain words mean. The word glory is found in all of its forms a little over 60 times in the New Testament. One of those forms is to glorify. 
And it comes from the Greek word doxodzo. And this particular word is used as a verb. And it's a word that means to extol. It's a word that means to praise, to magnify. Thayer, in his Greek definitions, he describes it as to ascribe honor to. Sometimes that Greek word doxodzo has been translated into two other English words outside of glorify, and that's the word magnify and also the word honor. I want to invite your attention over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 31. Here we're going to notice the Apostle Paul once again talking about this idea of bringing glory to God. And I want you to notice what he has to say here. He says, whatever you eat, drink, or whatever you do, now pay very, very close attention, do just a little bit to the glory of God. Does your Bible say anything like that? All right, let's read it again. Whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, do some to the glory of God. Does your Bible say that? My Bible doesn't say that either. When you go back and you look at what the inspired pen of the Apostle Paul wrote there, he says, do all to the glory of God. You know what he's telling us? He says, we are to honor God to praise, to magnify God in every aspect of our life. There's not going to be a single area of our life where we're going to keep God out. There's not going to be a single aspect of our life where we're not going to honor Him and magnify Him with the way that we live. If you go over to John chapter 15 and verse 8, Jesus said, Herein is my Father glorified. Now how is he glorified? He says that you bear much fruit. When we bear fruit, God is glorified. But it's very important to understand that we are to bear a certain kind of fruit. You see, when you look at Matthew chapter 7, Jesus there at the the latter part of the Sermon on the Mount, He said, Ye shall know them by their fruits. Chapter 7, verse 16, also verse 20. In the context, He's talking about false teachers. He says, You can know an individual based on the fruit that they're bearing, whether it's good fruit or whether it's bad fruit. Here's the question that you and I need to be asking ourselves. Are we bearing fruit for the God of heaven? Or are we bearing fruit for the devil? When we look at our life and we examine every aspect, who is it that we're honoring? Who is it that we're magnifying? Who is it that we're giving our praise to? Let's think about a second question. We've seen the what, now let's talk about why. Why should we glorify God? Let me invite your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we're going to look at verse 20. And as you're turning there to verse 20, I want you to keep in mind that Paul is going to give us three keys as to why we should live our lives to the glory of God. He's going to give us some motivations. But why is it that people go to work? What motivates an individual to do that? Well, some people it's it's motivated because they want to take care of their family. It's motivated because they want to be able to, to do this or they want to be able to do that. Some people are motivated to go to work because it gives them something to do. In life, there are all types of motivations for us to do something. And it's no different when it comes to our spiritual life. 
Why should I honor God with my life? Why should you honor God with your life? Paul's going to give us the answer. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 20. He says, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Here is the first key. Here's the first motivation as to why I should live my life to magnify the Father who is in heaven. Number one, because we have been purchased. He says, you have been bought with a price. And the price that we've been bought with, it did not come as a bargain. I'm like many of you, when I go shopping for something, I want to get a good bargain. I I want to feel like that I haven't been stolen from. I I want to feel like I haven't been robbed. I I want to feel like that I've got something at a decent cost. But you know, when it comes to our soul, it was bought, it was purchased at the highest of prices. The death of God's only begotten Son. The purchased became through His precious blood. When you look at Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, Jesus said, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give His life a ransom, a payment for many. And let me invite your attention over to 1 Peter chapter 1 for a moment. And Peter's going to elaborate on this just a little bit more. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 18. He says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The precious blood of Jesus went into purchasing our soul. And when we think about a motivating factor, if for no other reason to live our lives to the glory of God, this would be reason enough. Knowing that somebody loved me, knowing that somebody loved you so much that they were willing to send their only begotten son. When I think about that high price that was paid, Oftentimes I think about an early Christian living in the second century, a man by the name of Polycarp. And many of you have heard about the persecution that this man faced. And as he was being persecuted and and they were asking him to renounce Christ, to turn his back on him, he said, for 80 and 6 years, he's done me no harm. How can I blaspheme my Lord. You know what he was saying? How can I turn my back on him? When I think about everything that he's done for me, how can I turn my back on the one that has provided so much? This man understood that he was to live his life to bring honor to God. And so number one, a first motivating factor is to understand that we've been purchased. Let me give you a second motivating factor. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. He says, you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. You and I have a purpose. And he says, our purpose is to glorify God. When Paul makes this statement, he wasn't giving a suggestion. When Paul makes this statement to glorify God, he wasn't giving a recommendation. Paul was giving a divine command that God expects of us, that we are to live our life, every aspect of it, to honor Him. In the context, it's dealing with living a pure life and refraining from certain things. Go back in the context to verse 18, and let's notice what Paul says. He says, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own 
body. When Paul said flee fornication, he said you get away from it as fast as you can. You run away from it as if you were being chased by a wild animal, as if your life depended on it. And then when you get down to verse 19 and verse 20, he said here's the reason. Here's the motivating factor why you do this. Because you've been purchased. And number two, because you have a purpose. But let's think about a third one here. Go back there to verse 20. He says, For you are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Look at that last phrase. Which are God's? You and I have been possessed. Let's think about that for just a moment. We are possessed. What happens when you buy something? When you give somebody else the money to purchase something, whose property does it become? It now becomes your property, doesn't it? God has given His Son, and that blood has purchased our soul. So now we belong to the one who has purchased us. Now there are some people that will say, well, you know, this is my body. And I'm going to do whatever I want to with this body because it belongs to me. Let me tell you this. If you're a child of God, you didn't read that from this book right here. But when it comes to giving honor and glory to God, you didn't read that kind of statement from this book. This book says something else for a Christian. It says, you've been possessed by Him. When we think about how God possesses us, he possesses our body. He's to possess our mind. He's to possess our heart. He's to possess our life. Does our life belong to the God of heaven? Or does our life belong to the God of this world? John 8, verse 44, which is the devil. Recently, I was visiting a man and his family who was having surgery. He had several family members that had come up to the Memphis area to one of our local hospitals. His family was from Tupelo. And his two sisters, they work together. And the place that they work at, their boss is a man who practices homosexuality. And you know what their boss told them one day? He said, I wish I could be like y'all. I wish I could be more like you. You know what he saw in their life? He saw people living their life to the glory of the Father. He saw individuals who were the possession of God. You know what they told him? They said, with some changes in your life, you can be just like us. You think about those thoughts a little bit more. Those ladies are bearing fruit. They're bearing fruit from the Father. You shall know them by their fruits. This man could see a difference in them. Can others see a difference in you? Can others see a difference in me? When we think about our homes, think about our jobs, co-workers, our classmates, Can others see you and I glorifying God? Tonight we've asked ourselves the question, why? Why should we do this? And we've seen three keys from 1 Corinthians 20. We've talked about the what. What does it mean to glorify God? For the rest of our time tonight, we're going to be dealing with the application side. And we're going to be spending several minutes talking about how we can apply these thoughts to our lives. But when we think about how can we glorify God, this book right here is going to give us the answers. Number one, it's going to be seen in our life. When it's seen in our life, first of all, we need to understand that it's not about self. 
It's not about you, and it's not about me. Let me invite your attention to a couple of passages that will illustrate this tonight. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9, and let's notice verse 23. Luke chapter 9 and verse 23. Jesus here, he's going to be making a very pointed statement. And as he makes this statement, it's concerning those who are considering following him. And Jesus wants them to count the cost. And part of counting that cost, he said, if if any man will follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Did you notice the first thing that Jesus said there? If you're going to follow me, In essence, if you're going to glorify the Father, the focus isn't going to be on you. It's not going to be on self. He said, let him deny himself. Before we can take up our cross, he says, first of all, you've got to deny self. Now let's parallel that with 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in verse 15. Here the Apostle Paul, he's going to write something very similar to what our Lord had to say. He said, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. He says, now that you're a Christian, now that you've gone through this change, that's what chapter 5 there is about. Now that you've gone through this change, you've put off that old man and you've put on the new man. You're no longer living for self. It's not about me. You see, when an individual obeys the gospel, his devotions, his desires, the focus is taken off self and the devotions are placed somewhere else. Drop down just two verses. And let's notice what Paul has to say here. He says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You see, when an individual becomes a child of God, he looks at life in a different way. He understands that his devotions are no longer here. His devotions are to be placed somewhere else. If you turn over to Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. When an individual becomes a new creature, Paul said, if you then be risen with Christ. What's he talking about there? If you go back into the context, chapter 2, he's talking about an individual that's been buried in baptism. And he goes on to say, if you then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things that are above not on things of the earth. If you look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, in a parallel passage, Paul says that when an individual obeys the gospel, they put that old man of sin to death. They raise to walk in newness of life. Our devotions have now changed. It's no longer about me. If it's no longer about me, who's it to be about? Our life now is to center around Jesus. Jesus is to be the essence of our life. When you look at Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live, I live in the flesh, or I live in the faith, by the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. He says, I am living for him. This body that I'm living in. In Philippians 1 and verse 21, he said, For me to live is Christ. Remember that last part? And to die is gain. As long as I'm living, I'm going to be bringing honor to Jesus because he's going to be the center of my life. Let me invite your attention to 1 Peter chapter 4. Here is one that's not quite as familiar as we think about Jesus being the center of our life. 
but it's one that I really like. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 2. Here the apostle Peter, he says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. A Christian's life falls into two distinct categories. Our life before we obeyed the gospel, and number two, our life after we obeyed the gospel. There's going to be a difference. Brethren, it's important for us to remember we can't change our past. But you know what we can change? We can change our future. We can change the direction of it. And Peter, he's talking about looking at the future. Our life is to be governed by the will of God. And so when we think about the how, it's going to be seen in the way that we live. First of all, understanding it's not about self. Second of all, understanding that my life is to revolve around Jesus. Let me give you a third idea under this point to keep in mind. There's going to be a difference in our actions. When you think about your actions, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, and you look beginning at verse 22, the Apostle Paul here, he's going to be writing about putting off the old man and putting on the new man. And you can almost think about it in this way, taking off a pair of dirty clothes, having our body cleansed and putting on some new clothes. When our soul has been cleansed, there's something to be something different about us. Our actions are going to be different. He says, you're going to put off that old man. You're going to put on the new man. And then, beginning in verse 25, he's going to talk about some things that we're going to put off. But not only does he say you're going to put some of these things off, you're going to put some things in its place. He'll talk about the old man. He's a man that that goes out and steals. But the new man, you want to know what he does? He's going to work hard for a living. He's going to do things honestly. The old man, he doesn't think twice about telling a lie. The new man, he's going to tell the truth to his neighbor. Who's our neighbor? Anyone with whom we come in contact He talks about corrupt communication. The old man, you're going to put that away. The new man, he's going to use words that are encouraging, that are designed to build up. The old man, verse 31, he's a man that's filled with anger. The new man, he's going to be one that's filled with kindness. He's going to be making our world a better place. That's what Christianity is about. Christianity is about making our world a better place. Jesus was saying, there's going to be something different about my followers. Let's think about another area where it's seen in our life. It's going to be seen in our example. By a show of hands, how many of you have an influence? Just by a show of hands. All right, a few hands went up. Okay, I, I need you to do something for me for just a moment. I know it may make you feel uncomfortable, but just humor me, fill me out for just a second. I want everybody to raise their hand. Okay, every person, I, I know that, that everyone in here can do this. Keep them raised until I tell you to put them down. How many of you have an influence? Okay, look around at each other for a moment. Keep them raised. Every single person in here has an influence. All right, keep them up. Now let's think about this question. How many of you have an example? Look around. Every hand's up. You can put them down now. Every single person has an example. And that example can be good. That example can be bad. It can be one that's positive. It can be one that is negative. I want you to think about this. Our examples are like magnets. They are either attracting people to our Lord or they're repelling people from the Lord. 
It's only one way or the other. That, that's what an example does. Remember, Jesus left us an example to follow in His footsteps, right? 1 Peter 2 and verse 21. Let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 for a moment. 1 Timothy chapter 4, and notice very carefully verse 12. Paul said, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. In word, that's your conversation, the way that you talk. The King James Version, the next word, is the word conversation. That's not a redundancy there. That, that doesn't have to deal with something verbal. It has to deal with the way that we live, our manner of life. In love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. All of these areas, he says, you're to be an influence. I'm to be an influence. Do you know who we're reflecting when we put those things in our life? We're reflecting Jesus. And that's what it means to live our lives to the honor and the glory of God. But let me give you a second thought here. How can I go about living my life to the glory of God? Number one, it's going to be seen in my life. Number two, it's going to be seen in my habits. A habit is something that we do with regularity. Now there are some habits that are very good habits. There are some habits that are very bad habits. I want to share with you some tonight that are designed to be some very good habits. They're designed to be ones that show us how to apply how we can live to the glory of God each day. Number one, get in the habit of daily Bible study. Daily Bible study. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, and you look at verse 13, Paul in writing to Timothy, he said, give exhortation to reading. If you drop down just two verses down to verse 15, he says, meditate upon these things. When we think about that word meditate, in our world today, there are many people that have this idea that to meditate, that basically you sit down on the ground, you cross your legs, you hold your hands out, and you close your eyes, and you hum. And, and that's their idea of meditation. That is not what Paul was writing about there. According to Thayer's Greek definitions, that word means to revolve in the mind. Paul says the things that you've been reading about, you're going to revolve them in the mind. You're going to think about them. You're going to dwell on them. Have you ever... Done your Bible reading perhaps at nighttime, or maybe first thing in the morning, and when you went off to work, you went off to school, you thought about what you read. You know what you were doing? You were meditating. You were letting that information revolve around in your mind. He says, that's what I want you to do with the scriptures. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Paul said, study to show thyself approved. Why do we want to study to show ourselves approved? So that we can be a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Some translations will say, handling aright, or handling accurately. If we can rightly divide the word, if we can handle it accurately, what's the opposite? A person can wrongly divide it, a person can handle it inaccurately and so he says you study so that you can be able to do that you give diligence now combine that in with Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 as he was talking about the Bereans he says these were more noble than those in the Thessalonica that they searched the scriptures how often daily whether these things were so. They did this on a daily basis. 
Most of us in this room eat food on a daily basis. Most people generally eat about three meals a day. Some people more, some people less. But what about when it comes to spiritual food? Shouldn't we think about our soul and feeding our soul on a regular basis as well, on a daily basis? I remember hearing Cliff Goodwin preach one time. I think y'all have had him here a number of times. But I remember Cliff preaching, and he said something very unique about the Bible. He's probably even said it here in the meetings that he's held. But he says, when it comes to this book right here, the Bible, it can either keep you from sin, or sin can keep you from this book. The Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. And if we're not careful, and aren't feeding our soul, you know what can happen? Our soul can start getting sick. We start to do things. We start to say things. We wouldn't normally do. We wouldn't normally say because we haven't been feeding ourselves properly. When you look at 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2, Peter says that those newborn babes, they desire the sincere milk of the Word that they may grow thereby. Have you ever turned on the television before? And maybe you saw a commercial that came across the screen, and it was an advertisement about poverty in a foreign country. And generally, they showed you a picture of of a small child. That small child has their shirt off, And you can look at their chest and pretty much count every single rib that they have. Scientifically, that's called an emaciation process that's taking place to the physical body. Do you know that if we only open our Bibles on Sundays and Wednesdays, two hours out of the, I forget off the top of my head how many hours we have in a week. How many? 168, two hours out of, three hours out of 168. You know what's going to happen to our spiritual body? We're going to start having that emaciation process takes place spiritually. How many of us could survive for very long just eating twice a week? It wouldn't take too long for us to get sick. And so when we think about the value of our spiritual life, When we think about our soul, one of the habits to bring glory to God in our life is to make sure that we are reading the Word of God on a daily basis. And when I I say that, that doesn't mean sitting down and reading three or four hours. Take 15 minutes a day. Take 15 minutes a day and spend some time in the Word of God. Now sometimes individuals will say, "You, you know, I'm just too busy. I'm just too busy to spend any time reading God's Word. You know what I I find interesting? Is that those same individuals that say that will always make time for the television. They'll always make time for the internet. They'll make time for Facebook. They'll make time for the telephone. They'll make time for texting. They'll make time for this and for that. You know, there's nothing wrong with being busy. Nothing wrong with being busy. But when we crowd out the most important things in our life, then it's wrong to be busy. Because we've got our priorities mixed placed. And we can't bring glory to God if our priorities are in the wrong place. Second habit. Let's make sure that we're regularly praying to God. The way that God communicates with us is through His Word. The way that we communicate with Him is through prayer. But what if you could sit down and and talk with any person in the world that you wanted to? You could have an hour of their time and you could talk about anything. Maybe you would say, I would like to have the ear of the President of the United States for one hour. Maybe you would like to meet the Queen of England and sit down and talk with her for an hour. 
you might like to meet some famous athlete. I remember when I was growing up, I wanted to meet Michael Jordan. Today's young people, they want to meet Steph Curry. What about a famous actor? Do you know that the creator of this universe wants to sit down and have a conversation with us? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul said, pray without ceasing. Does that mean that every hour of every day, every minute, every second, we're going to be praying? That's not what that means. What he's meaning there is do it with regularity. Make it a, a, something that's natural, something that's a habit in your life. Number three, get in the habit of regularly visiting others. Remember James chapter 1 and verse 27? James says that we're to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction, keep ourselves unspotted from the world. I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 15, verse 36 for just a moment. In Acts chapter 15, the Apostle Paul, he's going to have a discussion with Barnabas. And the discussion has to deal with going on another mission trip together. And I want you to notice what he has to say. He said, let's go again, Acts 15, 36, let's go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. You know what the word visit means? I think a lot of times we've reduced it to simply a social call. In the scriptures, it's more than a social call. It means to inspect. It means to look over, to look into, to examine. When Paul said, let's go back and see how they do, he said, let's go back and examine the situation. Let's go back and inspect what's going on. Let's look after them. Several years ago, Truth and Love Lectureship did a lectureship on the one another passages in the New Testament. I probably have worn that book out. Love that book. When you think about all of those one another passages, to love one another, be compassionate one to another, kind one to another, serve one another, even admonish one another, reprove one another, rebuke one another, bear ye one another's burdens. Do you know one of the ways that we accomplish all of those? when we go and visit someone. Even when you have to make a visit that's not necessarily one that's positive in nature, you still accomplish those one another passages. And you know what? You're following the Word of God. Let me give you a fourth one, and the lesson will be yours. When we think about our habits doing something on a regular basis, Let's make sure that we are growing spiritually. Let's make sure that we're growing. The Apostle Paul on one occasion said, I've learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content, Philippians 4 and verse 11. The contentment that he was talking about there had to deal with whatever physical situation that he found himself in life. But I think sometimes people want to apply that spiritually and they get content where they are spiritually. On another occasion, just a chapter back in that book, Paul said, I press toward the mark. You know what he was doing? He was growing. I'm continuing to grow closer to the Lord every single day of my life. One final passage, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. When you look at 2 Peter 1 and verse 5, Peter says, and beside this, giving all diligence, look at this next phrase, add to your faith. You know what he's saying? He's saying grow. And then he gives several areas where you and I can grow spiritually. And he says, if you do these things and abound, ye shall never fall. You know what? 
We're growing closer to the Lord when we add to our faith. As we start to bring this study to a close tonight, we've asked ourselves the question, what does it mean to glorify God? It's a word that means to magnify, to extol, to praise, to ascribe honor to. Second of all, we've asked ourselves the question, why? What's my motivation? And we've noticed three reasons from 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 20. We've closed with the how. How can we glorify God? How can we live our lives to the glory of God each day? We talked about the fact that it's going to be seen in our life and it's going to be seen in our habits. When we sing the song, To God Be the Glory, does our life, does our habits represent the message that we're singing in that song? When we think about our life, this very moment, this very hour, Are you bringing glory and honor and praise to the God of heaven? Or are you bringing glory and honor and praise to the God of this world? John 8 verse 44. Some people may say, well, you know, two days a week, I make sure that I bring glory to God. But now when it comes Monday, mm, I really struggle with that. When I go back to work, when I go back to school, when I'm around my friends, the fruit that people are seeing, it really looks more like I'm bringing honor to the devil, to the God of this world. The number one goal of every single child of God should be to live our life in such a way every single day to bring honor and glory to the Father. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Jesus here is concluding a point about being the light of the world. And when he concludes this point, he gives the reason for it. He says that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. When other people see you and I, are we lighting the way to the Father? Somebody needs that. Or are we lighting the way to the devil? You can think about it like this. Think about a runway. Is our life lighting the runway to the Father? Or is it lighting the runway to the devil? You're the only one that can answer that question. But the bottom line is this, are you living your life each day to the glory of God? And if not, tonight's the night to make the necessary changes. It may be the case that you're not a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you're not going to be able to bring glory to God. Tonight, if you're not one of God's children, tonight's the night to do it. Sometimes we sing the song, today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. We're not promised another five minutes here on this earth. Let's make sure that we're God's children and we're faithful children. If you'll believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, John 8 and verse 24. If you'll be willing to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. If you'll be willing to make the great confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8 and verse 37, and then be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, you can leave here tonight as one of God's children. But please understand that when you make that commitment, you're raising to walk in newness of life, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. There are going to be some new commitments. And those that have been obedient to the gospel, are you being faithful to your commitments? Are you faithfully committing yourselves to God each day? Or are you committing yourselves to the devil? What do other people see? Most importantly, 
What does God say? The Apostle Paul said in every aspect of our life, we need to bring honor and glory to God. Tonight, if you're subject to heaven's invitation, whether it's in obedience to the gospel or coming back to the fold through repentance and prayer, won't you come forward as together we stand and as we sing.